So here we are now beginning our uh, little series for uh, uh, this month, for the month of September, which is devoted uh, uh, to the uh, uh, famous uh, and delightful scripture usually referred to as the hymn of the pearl, and that is what we will begin this evening. Uh, and then, uh, depending on uh, how well we proceed with the text, we may have some uh, additional material toward the end of the month, but that uh, remains to be seen. So let me uh, uh, begin with a digression, which is uh, what I usually do, <laughs> namely that most of you are aware that one of my uh, favorite people for the last century and more was Carl Gustav Jung, and I wrote two books about him, and I uh, feel that he was a truly important and a prophetic figure. And so I, I remember a little incident in uh, Jung's life, which was recounted uh, by uh, 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 somebody who was visiting in Zurich at the time. Uh, it was probably the Chilean diplomat, whose name I can't remember at the moment, uh, in uh, Miguel Serrano, who wrote a very nice small book called C.G. Jung and Hermann Hesse, A Record of Two Friendships, that is really worth reading. Later on in his life, he wrote a lot of balderdash, but that is, uh, that is a, uh, a situation that uh, afflicts writers. But anyway, Serrano wrote this incident with Jung, that he was standing with Jung in, in uh, Kusnacht, which is just a district of Zurich, you know, uh, right near the lake. The wind was blowing along the reeds, and uh, Jung was looking out over the countryside, and he said, no one knows, no one understands. And then he stopped, and he said, uh, but only a poet could begin to understand. And since uh, Serrano was somewhat of a poet himself, I think he was quite pleased with that statement. But in any event, uh, I am mentioning that um, because I think it can act as a, an apt introduction to our subject. Uh, the, uh, among the Naj Hamadi uh, Gospels, which we were reviewing, and other uh, materials that are generally classified as Gnostic, uh, there are very few that uh, qualify as poetry. The hymn, what is often called uh, uh, the hymn of the pearl certainly qualifies as one. In fact, uh, uh, the, the Hymn of the Pearl or the Hymn of the Robe of Glory, which is another translation for it, are um, uh, they, interestingly enough, this seldom happens. Uh, when, when they were discovered, uh, they are two, there were two copies, original copies, in two languages, one in Syriac and one in Greek. Syriac was sort of a vernacular that a lot of Middle Eastern people spoke at that time. And for our purposes, the, the entire scripture really deserves the name him because it is written in, uh, uh, in rhyme and other uh, uh, characteristics of poetry. So it is one of the very few scriptures that is, uh, is actually poetry, both in Syriac and in Greek. Uh, so that's, that's quite an accomplishment. Uh, that in turn uh, brings up perhaps the larger subject, namely that the entire uh, esoteric tradition, Gnosis, 
whatever we may call it, uh, should be considered uh, with the greatest profit uh, as a form of poetry. And I think the, one of the great difficulties that has arisen with the esoteric tradition that its greatest revival in recent centuries occurred at the very uh, last quarter of the 19th century, which was a time when people were, uh, I think, without adequate justification or even knowledge, uh, extremely fond of what they were pleased to call science. And uh, uh, therefore, a kind of pseudo-scientific, uh, uh, over-intellectualized and over-conceptualized approach uh, became very popular uh, in the 19th century. And uh, that uh, approach to the tradition has never entirely waned. And I think it would have been much, much better, and it would be much better today if our approach to this mysterious tradition were of a more uh, artistic and more poetic nature. And I think that even as Jung, speaking of his own visionary approach to reality, said that only a poet could understand, uh, it is justified if we say the same thing about the gnosis and the various other branches of the, of the esoteric tradition, including uh, theosophy. The most uh, exciting and also most informative uh, disclosures, let us say, of people like Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, like uh, Annie Besant and others, uh, when we look at them uh, very close, have a highly uh, uh, feeling toned and poetic nature. Also, we might say that some of the greatest poets, certainly of the English language, but also of some other languages, were some of the, the great poets William Blake, uh, for instance, uh, even Shakespeare, and then when we come over and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and others, were uh, esotericists by way of their poetic approach to reality. The reason for this is that one needs to keep in mind that um, the esoteric tradition is not concerned with uh, facts or pseudo-facts, but it is concerned with uh, uh, causes. Causes that are way beyond uh, the factual and which give rise to uh, manifestations which are sometimes factual which are sometimes uh, inspirational and uh, have, can have various other uh, names, but uh, their origin is, of, uh, uh, is more in feeling than it is in, it's a good Victorian term, I don't know whether you heard it lately, ratiocination. I love weird words like this, you know, they, uh, they, they give a certain uh, a prestige to the person who utters them, <laughs> ratiocination. So, uh, and uh, the reason for it, of course, being that there are various functions of uh, human consciousness and that among these functions, uh, the feeling function uh, has a uh, certain connection with, uh, uh, well, let's say, with the world of transcendence, with the, with the, the tran for what Jung called the transcendental function, which is very, very important. 
And uh, when we uh, don't pay enough attention to that, and when we try to sort of factualize subjects that uh, are of a different nature, of a different character, we do them injustice. And so uh, uh, this is an important thing to remember because to my knowledge, and uh, my knowledge be owing to my age and so forth is spotty, you know. Now I remember something, 10 minutes later I don't remember it. <laughs> and so I have to have notes and various reminders to remind me what I ought to be saying. <laughs> you know. But the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, issue in this case being that uh, uh, I am not really aware of a uh, scripture, uh, of a religious or uh, even esoteric nature uh, that uh, is uh, poet poetry, that was written in poetry. Although no doubt uh, you, you find uh, poetic and feeling toned uh, scriptures in various places. For instance, the Book of the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, 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 various others, but they're still different. And here we have a fairly lengthy scripture that is entirely written in meter and in verse. In its own, in two different languages, which is really a, a peculiar situation. Uh, so, from this I, and other related circumstances, we may deduce that uh, our uh, text that we shall be contemplating these days and uh, this month uh, should be approached uh, with the heart rather than with the head. And this is uh, difficult to do because uh, people have gotten it into their heads largely owing to a mistranslation of some Greek words like gnosis, that, uh, that gnosis is in intellectual knowledge. That was never the case. Gnosis is spiritual knowingness. Uh, and uh, it is in... Elaine Pagels, you know, the first great uh, uh, translator and the publicizer of the Naj Hammadi scriptures, has uh, actually stated that uh, probably the best modern word to translate gnosis is consciousness. I'm sure Carl Jung would have agreed. And uh, this is, uh, these are important issues because the manner in which we approach certain subjects and the documents of, uh, of those subjects is of great, great importance. And uh, when we approach the, uh, the subject of esoterica, we, we have to have a uh, strong component of our approach being your know, feeling, rather than of the intellect. We have to realize that the thinking function, the intellect takes us only so far. Because uh, I suppose one, uh, one reasonably uh, accurate uh, definition of the feeling function could be that it is the, the fuel of the life of the soul. Without feeling, we are not going anywhere. There is no gas in the tank. <laughs> you know? uh, with feeling, there is no limit where we may go. And so this is very uh, important. Hmm. Reality is, is something, just in general, reality is not something that is here for us to figure out. Reality is here as something for us to experience. And when we experience it, then all kinds of interesting things may happen. When we just try to figure it out, then we are uh, 
we are sort of moving in a, in, on a dead path that ultimately doesn't lead anywhere. And this is important to remember, especially when we come to such a subject as what has been called the, uh, uh, the uh, hymn of the pearl or the hymn of the robe of glory. Uh, we mentioned uh, last month when we talked a lot about uh, the figure of uh, Thomas, St. Thomas Didymus, Judas Thomas the Apostle, that uh, uh, um, in addition to uh, other writings, such as the Gospel of Thomas that has been discovered within, in the Naj Hammadi finds and so forth, uh, the, there were uh, at least uh, two interconnected scriptures uh, that were left behind and which were attributed to Didymus Judas Thomas, the, uh, the disciple of Jesus. And that uh, they have been uh, combined in terms of their publications uh, frequently uh, as the, the, uh, uh, the Acts of Thomas, Apostolic Acts. There are other, other figures to whom such acts are attributed, probably the most important one being the Acts of John, which are uh, attributed to uh, John, the beloved disciple, who was, uh, according to uh, the New Testament, the closest uh, uh, to Jesus, and which uh, we, we have good quotations of them that you may wish to uh, experience around Easter time because it has the, uh, it has the, uh, the famous scene where John the Apostle uh, is down by the crucifixion and he cannot stand the, the agony of the situation, so he runs away. He runs up into the mountains and there he uh, seeks refuge in a cave, which has been sort of a place of his meditations before. And while he stands in front of the cave, looking down at Jerusalem, where the crucifixion scene is taking place, all of a sudden the, the spiritual Jesus appears. And he huge, he appears like a, like a living cross. And he says to him, John, John, why are you looking down at that? That is a mere, mere terrestrial e event. That is a merely, a merely physical happening. Look at me, I'm here, I'm not being crucified. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so these are the kinds of things that we find scattered throughout these acts. And the, certainly the same is true of the acts of Thomas. Now the, the Acts of Thomas were so famous. I was just talking to a friend of mine who in his somewhat like myself, but to I think to a longer uh, chronological span, had spent time in a monastery. And he says that clear when he, he was uh, in a monastic seminary in the 1950s and in the 1940s, the Acts of Thomas were read communally and individually by monks in monastic orders. So it was still, uh, it was not considered a heretical scripture, but a scripture with much uh, instructive and inspiring value. Now I spoke about this before and I don't want to repeat myself too much, so let me say that uh, the, the Acts of Thomas, very important uh, scripture which was read uh, by people uh, but in a religious life right up to our own days. Uh, that uh, There are two great stories in it and I will only mention the first one very briefly. The first one is that uh, Thomas, uh, who is of course left behind when Jesus leaves the world and the sense Thomas has a vision 
and Jesus appears to him and tells him that he ought to go to India. Now, uh, that was a big journey and uh, a difficult advice to follow even in those days. Uh, I was invited twice to India and I didn't go. So that, that shows you that uh, Thomas had more determination and perseverance. And probably he felt that his, he would uh, tolerate eating hot curry better than the rest, the rest of us. But in any event, he had to go to India. And on his way to India, the first stop, and I mentioned this before, I'll just mention it very briefly, because it is an important scripture uh, of its own. Um, there occurs an event wherein Thomas, on his journey, while he uh, disembarks from his ship for a while in a strange city, he's invited to go to a ve wedding. And this wedding turns out to be the the wedding of wisdom and the wedding of truth and wisdom, as it is sometimes called. And it, so it, it becomes a completely, uh, uh, a completely uh, illumined, uh, altered state experience wherein all of a sudden he finds himself in uh, the bridal chamber with, with wisdom, Sophia, who is getting married and all the various uh, spiritual entities who are around and sort of a, a very great visionary experience. Then it's all over and he's got to go back on the ship and go to India. Um, not an enviable fate. Uh, uh, so in any event, that's, that's the first major part of the Acts of Thomas. And the second part is the one that we are dealing with. And the setting for it is, um, if, you are, uh, if you are one of those people who likes the man from La Mancha, as I do, and uh, not only in the modern dramatic setting, but uh, uh, as, as the writing of Don Quixote, uh, you will remember that uh, uh, at least the, the musical starts that way, that he finds himself in the... Com that uh, Don Quixote finds himself in the company of uh, this sort of strange people, beggars and criminals and people like that, who beg him to tell them a story. And then he tells them the story of Don Quixote. Uh, so uh, what you have here, the same thing is happening to Thomas. Thomas runs afoul of the local authorities and uh, the versions of that vary, but it is probably primarily because he converted the, the wife of a Maharaja uh, and uh, somehow uh, the Maharaja was not very happy about this. And so he threw Thomas in jail. And so there he is with all these jailbirds uh, and, and uh, they gather around him and they say, oh, you're a holy man, a wise man, please be nice to us and tell us, tell us a good story. And then Thomas gets up and he puts forth the uh, hymn, <coughs> hymn of the pearl. So the, the setting is that he composes this narrative right on the spot while he is imprisoned, and of course, ultimately, the tradition says that he was, he was martyred and uh, buried uh, outside of the city of Madras, actually very close to where the headquarters of the Theosophical Society has been ever since uh, its foundation and still is, and that uh, uh, he, he tells uh, a story to these people which has... Uh, very uh, profound and transcendental spiritual meaning. Uh, so, uh, therefore, uh, uh, I, will, I will mention just for your uh, in information that I uh, feel that there are sort of four uh, major mythologems, three, four major myths. 
that you can find present in the Gnostic scriptures and woven sometimes several of them in the same scripture. Uh, now, uh, maybe we have to take yet a step back. Um, I'll never get to the story if I keep this up. <laughs> you know, but we need to uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, as uh, indeed uh, scholarship, particularly scholarship informed by modern analytical psychology, has correctly stated uh, the uh, um, the. Uh, there are experiences of the psyche, of the soul, the deep experiences, experiences that transcend earthly things. Uh, these experiences can only be uh, recounted and remembered in the form of myth. So transcendental experience translates itself in consciousness into a myth. And therefore, there are four main uh, uh, mythologems in the Gnostic tradition. And they are the first one, which we, we will use right now in connection with the, uh, with the hymn of the pearl, is the myth of the journey of the soul. Where did we come from? Where did we go? Where are we going? What is, the, what is the strange movements, the strange uh, changes uh, that we are on the go? What is this all about? So the myth of the journey of the soul. The second is the myth of the eternal feminine, usually named the divine Sophia. The third one is the myth of the Logos, the savior. And the fourth is the myth of the nasty fellow, the Demiurge. The Demiurge, the half-maker, who uh, creates an unhappy and unsatisfactory world and tries to keep everybody there. Not a very, uh, not a, not a very nice fellow to encounter. Uh, but let's say all um, these are all themes incidentally, although some of them more powerfully expressed uh, that uh, are contained in the myth of the hymn of the pearl, although perhaps the one of the myth of the journey of the soul would be the, uh, the closest to these uh, subjects themselves. Now, um, yeah. all right. I, I mentioned already the mystic version of the heavenly marriage, uh, uh, which being the first part of the Acts of Thomas. And then, uh, uh, then we come to the one that is our uh, subject matter now and for a few days to come, namely the, the hymn of the pearl or the hymn of the robe of glory. Uh, <clears throat> It is also referred to as the official title of it. If you, you see the, the text says, The Song of the Apostle Thomas in the Land of the Indi Indies. It is written, as I mentioned, in meter, and it is uh, a genuine poem. So here we shall read it uh, as a as a part of the text, and I will, I will read the various portions of it in order to... Uh, oh, let's see where I have oh, yeah, Here we are. So it, you, you need to imagine, just like in the, uh, in the beginning of The Man from La Mancha, you see Thomas among these rascals, uh, uh, as they sit, sitting and standing around him, and he says, all right, I will tell you a story. Now, we need to keep in mind, of course, uh, as one should, uh, especially in connection with mythological sto stories, that uh, storytelling uh, was 
and in many respects still is one of the main items of instruction uh, that leads to deeper spiritual insight, as I mentioned, uh, mentioned in other terms before. So here is uh, Thomas sitting in the midst of the Indian rascals, probably all wearing their loin cloths and their turbans, uh, and maybe uh, smoking a bit of bang out of their pipes, you know, <laughs> which is probably the origin of getting the bang out of some a bang out of something. In any event, there they are, and he is telling them the story. When I was a little child and dwelt in the kingdom of my father's house and delighted in the wealth and splendor of those who raised me, my parents sent me forth from the east, our homeland, uh, with provisions for the journey. From the riches of our treasure house, they tied me a, a bundle, great it was, yet light so that I might carry it alone. They took off from me the robe of glory, which in their love they had made for me, and my purple mantle that was woven to conform exactly to my figure, and made a covenant with me, and wrote it in my heart that I might not forget it. When thou goest down into Egypt, and bringest the one pearl which lies in the middle of the sea, which is encircled by the roaring serpent, thou shalt put on again thy robe of glory and thy mantle over it, and with thy brother, our next in rank, be heir in our kingdom. So what we have here is a, a celestial being a celestial child, a, uh, a sort of an ancient Middle Eastern version uh, of uh, uh, a divine bambino who lives in heaven, in heaven with his heavenly parents, but who, ha who is uh, given a task, a difficult task, a task that really he doesn't know anything about. And that task is to go down, as he mentioned, as they mentioned here in Egypt, and there find a treasure, a treasure that they refer to as a pearl, and to uh, take this pearl somehow away from its guardian and bring it back to the heavenly kingdom. And uh, so being an obedient child, he is prepared to do that. Now, uh, let's reflect a little bit on some of the mythologems that are uh, uh, present in this early part of the, the hymn of the pearl, namely, uh, the little child, a youthful, uh, uh, youthful inexperience of the soul in its original condition. Uh, in uh, the esoteric tradition, we might say that we, we all come from a mysterious transcendental place. The frequent Gnostic word for it in the Gnostic myths is pleroma, the fullness, because it is uh, it is full of glory and full of uh, potentialities. And uh, then uh, we, or at least some of us, go forth from that place. Uh, we are all uh, innocents when we go forth. Mm. And therefore, uh, inexperience and naivete are to be expected. And we need to remember, therefore, and this, this is, of course, a, a mythological statement of uh, Gnostic cosmology, we might say, that we are not of this world. We did not originate here. Uh, and uh, thus, uh, we are naive 
it's quite understandable that when we are born into this world, uh, mistakes will be made by us. Mm. And uh, this uh, determines in many ways the course of our, our lives. We are also given, however, and that is maybe a, an even more important statement, we are given provisions for the journey. The, the great burden which is light. So uh, when we come into this world, we are not uh, sent forth without resources. And uh, that needs to be remembered throughout our lives. Because as I'm sure you will agree, uh, as life goes on and its various vicissitudes befall us and the various experiences come to us, we uh, often uh, feel, as the old spiritual has it, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Uh, and. Uh, so what we have here is that the, the coming into this physical world is a uh, difficult undertaking, one that uh, brings consequences with it, which are uh, often of a, an unpleasant nature. Uh, and. Uh, so the, in, in the, the Gnostic mythic understanding, uh, we, need to, we need to start out with the provision that we are not of this world. We came here, and now we are here, but we, are not, we did not originate here. Our uh, physical bodies which we inhabit uh, are a vesture that we have come to assume. They are a necessity because without it we wouldn't be able to get around. But on the whole, um, this is not, not only, it is not our home and it is not our ultimate destiny. So what is it then? Uh, I, I asked myself that uh, already when I was a small child. As I, as I sometimes repeat, I don't know why, you know, old people repeat things. Uh, I, uh, I wasn't at all happy when I was born. Of course, my parents told, told me that I yelled like uh, all, cre all creation, but that's just a, an external sign. But somehow, I, can you imagine, I mean, all these decades and decades later, I still have a memory of a, a profound uh, uh, disappointment and unhappiness. Oh no, not this stubborn place again, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, why, why, why do I find myself here? And it took me years to kind of reconcile myself to the, uh, the curious place where I ended up. Uh, and uh, I'm not really so sure that at this advanced stage I'm still, whether I am really reconciled to it or not. Uh, but let's say uh, the, the, uh, it is important to remember that the, uh, the spiritual essence, and essence is a term that is actually used in some of the scriptures, the spiritual essence of the human coming into this world is from elsewhere. As, uh, I think in the, the poem by Wordsworth, which I will not recount at this time, it says that it, it had, had elsewhere its setting and comet from afar. So that we are, uh, even though we may not be of the, uh, the flying saucer convictions, like some people, and now you, once again you hear about it in Congress and everything, I think that the, uh, the uh, Star Trek people have probably invaded Congress, and that's why Congress is doing such strange things. Uh, so it, it, it's all a matter of aliens. Uh, but uh, let us say uh, what we have here is uh, that we are, uh, we are aliens, in a sense. 
are in the deepest strata of our nature, at the most profound center of our being, there is a, a center which is clearly not of this world. It has not been produced, it has not been produced by the physical world. Uh, it is by in its very nature of a different reality. And this different reality in turn uh, is probably uh, very deeply involved with why we are here, because that is certainly a big question. All right, so, so where did they come to this place? I haven't, I have, I haven't answered that question yet. Um, I'm still waiting for the answer, you know. But what is it? It is that uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the non-terrestrial realm the higher uh, and more subtle regions of reality, uh, which, uh, which comprise the, the fountain and origin of all existence. These uh, exist and they are still in contact with their emanations. Uh, the, uh, needless to say, the, uh, the creation myth of the uh, Judeo-Christian uh, scriptures uh, is uh, uh, is not the creation myth of uh, the esoteric tradition. The esoteric, in the esoteric tradition, this is this is this is of great importance, but very easy to miss. Indicates that in their in their essence, in their inmost core, all things and all beings come from the same reality. We are of the same reality. We are all of the same essence. But there is a process that began long ago and far away, uh, which uh, consists in the pouring forth, which is what emanation means, a pouring forth into other and lesser realities of some of that, uh, some of that highest essence. And so uh, we ourselves, as well as uh, all other creatures and uh, beings and objects came from afar and are here. And once we are here, uh, then let's say the great question arises, which I have, I have started out with, why? Why are we here? And this why is something that needs to be discovered. Because we, we have a program, if you want to use that stupid word, uh, you know, we have a program, we have a, a, a task that has been entrusted to us. And the task, as, as, it, as mentioned in the very beginning of the hymn of the Pearl, the task is to go to Egypt. Now, why Egypt? First of all, Egypt was an extremely important uh, culture and civilization for thousands of years, and therefore of uh, very great uh, repute. But in, in addition to that, uh, there is, a, there is a play on words, which we have encountered already in uh, the Gospel of the Egyptians, for instance. And the play on word is that Egypt, uh, to the ancient world, uh, was defined as a dark land. The darkness not being anything evil or unpleasant, but it, the dark land because to this day, the river Nile, uh, in its periodic overflowing, brings the black mud and floods the countryside. And it is out of that black mud that uh, various things can be grown, like the famous Egyptian cotton uh, uh, and many other things. So that, uh, uh, and that is 
why, for instance, in the later period, actually when the esoteric tradition was uh, 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 about to be uh, in danger uh, at the beginning, when the beginning, when the Christian religion took over everything, there came about a, uh, which is a, which was also called the the science of the dark land, alchemy. Al can be the Arabic words being the something from the land of Chem, from the dark land. And uh, so this is what is <coughs> meant, meant here, that Egypt was sort of regarded as the, the big cultural milieu. If anything important was going to happen, it was going to happen in Egypt, not anywhere else. After all, Egypt has been there for thousands of years and has uh, produced clear up to the post-Christian, the Alexandrian period, such outstanding and amazing individuals as uh, my uh, greatly admired Alexander the Great uh, and others. And so Egypt, uh, Egypt is sort of the, the symbol of the whole world. So what we have here now, it says you, you have to go there. Uh, and uh, we have a task for you. Mm. And uh, so here we are, the youthful inexperience of the soul in its original condition. Uh, we are all innocents when we go forth. Uh, and uh, we receive, however, and this is quite important, we receive, however, provisions for the journey. The, and it is a great burden which is light. So uh, we come into this world from another dimension, from another realm, from another level of existence, but we are not without resources in thus coming forth. Uh, uh, we have what it takes to prevail. And that is something that maybe we need to remind ourselves and each other as often as possible, because let's say uh, uh, feelings of uh, inadequacy, of lack of resources, uh, uh, and the one happiness are uh, certainly attendant upon earthly life. Uh, but actually, if we uh, lead our lives with some guidance and some insight, then uh, we uh, will recognize that in spite of appearances, uh, it seems that uh, we have what it takes to prevail. We have resources, but they have to be utilized. And this is another thing that is quite important, that we, we have our talents, which is an, in, uh, an ancient uh, uh, Roman word for uh, treasure, for money. If you receive a lot of talents as your salary, you're going to be rich. You know, that's what it was. And then it, it came to be used as a metaphor for our uh, interior treasure, for our uh, abilities uh, which we can exercise. So uh, uh, we, are, we are indeed not of this world. Uh, uh, and thus we may be naive mistakes will be, will be made. But we have provisions for the journey. We are not sent forth without resources. We have what it takes to prevail. Uh, we ha and we have it, uh, and that's, that's difficult for us to realize because of the, uh, the uh, who I would say, uh, uh, unjustified humility that has been drummed into us, uh, namely that we, uh, we have it by right. We have our resources by right, 
not by grace and not by merit. In other words, we don't have to earn our talents. They came with us from the fullness. Uh, and uh, neither are they just merely bestowed on us by grace, but we have, they are ours. The Christendom debated whether we have our salvific powers by merit or by grace. But neither of these is true according to the esoteric tradition. We have it by right. And uh, interestingly enough, the narrating protagonist of the hymn of the pearl is called a prince. And uh, this, I think, is as an indication in uh, language of uh, our, uh, our natural uh, nobility. We are not uh, nobody. <laughs> But rather, as the Spanish would say, we are hijo de algo. We are the son of somebody. <laughs> and this is, this is important. Uh, we come from somewhere. Our spiritual ancestry, ancestry is great and noble and godly. We are all noble men and noble women of God. Princely persons. We are not mere slaves of the lesser world. So the, uh, we, are of, we are the nobility of divine descent. Now, uh, life is neither a meritocracy, nor is it a slave market, but it is a field of activity for noble heroes. And I think it's important for us to remember. We are not here to just get by, neither are we here to uh, uh, acquire merit in the sight of some judgmental power, but we are here uh, uh, to uh, fulfill a distant and yet extremely powerful destiny that we have. Now what happens to us? What happened to us? long ago, and what happens to the, uh, to the child in the hymn of the pearl. They took from me the robe of glory. Now, uh, robe uh, is the outer mark of dignity. A robe that conforms to our true form, it is also mentioned. So we are directed, no, we, we are divested of the outer signs of our true inward dignity. Uh, and uh, for that reason, human beings are books that should not be judged by their cover. <laughs> In other words, we may not look and we, we may not feel as a very uh, nice, very intelligent, very, uh, very bright, very promising person, but we are that nevertheless. We have the, the potential that we brought with us from a distant and marvelous place. We are, a no, we are of a nobility of divine descent. Uh, so uh, when the, however, uh, the robe, the mask of the dignity has been taken from us when we enter this world. For we are uh, uh, divested of the outer signs of our true inward dignity. And, and uh, the outer reality or riches or success or health or other features are no indication of our inner worth. The true shape what the Greeks would call the typos. Uh, the real typos of our being is taken away and will be recovered only when we have fulfilled our task. Uh, we might even be, uh, mm, we might even be, be too awesome to behold. 
uh, if our true spiritual form were there. Somewhat like in the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna uh, shows himself in his true form to his uh, uh, to Arjuna uh, and uh, scares the living daylight out of him. So. Uh, uh, we need to keep in mind, therefore, that uh, there is a task. And in order to fulfill that task, uh, we change our status from uh, a transcendental and celestial uh, st uh, status and come into an imperfect world. Uh, but what are we to find there? It's not just the experience to be in a different place. But this, need, this is important and this needs to be kept in mind. The pearl. The, now what is a pearl? A pearl has been called the tear of the oyster. It is a precious thing that is produced by injured life. It's not a diamond, it's not a ruby, it is not an emerald, uh, which are cold products of material nature. As nice they may look on our finger or in other uh, uh, places in jewelry. Not a diamond, not a ruby. Uh, it is an... We are what we seek and what we eventually shall find. Now, this is the great promise. Uh, what we seek is not an evolutionary product, but it is the tear of life, the pearl. It is gnosis. It is produced in the sea of life, the ocean of forgetfulness, in secret, in the closed oyster, in the mystery, where the pearl is formed. Also, the pearl, as uh, the Gospel of Thomas says, the pearl has fallen into the mud, but it has its value in the sight of its owner at all times. Uh, the dead oyster in the mystery of the pearl is formed. Also, the pearl has fallen into the mud, as I mentioned, which is a metaphor for the true soul, the oversoul, the Jungian self, enclosed in an animal underneath the waters of the unconscious, the center of real consciousness hides. We have to find it. Heaven itself will be mysteriously enriched when we do. So there is, a, there is a purpose. And the purpose is not what this lower world might uh, lead us to believe. And the, it, uh, yeah, it is so it's right in the uh, in the uh, directives that are given to the child in heaven, is that in in the dog, in there is a serpent uh, who guards the pearl, and uh, this it it is it is a difficult task to take the treasure from the serpent. That is why earthly life has its various uh, difficulties. Adversaries, opposition is present and has many wiles. So uh, we need to look at our text a little bit further. And there is the, uh, there is the issue that we mentioned of uh, of being, being sent and from a high and holy place. 
So the child now says, I left the East and took my way downwards, unaccompanied by two royal, oh, sorry, not, unaccompanied by two royal envoys, since the way was dangerous and hard, and I was young for such a journey. I passed over the borders of my Shan, the gathering place of the merchants of the East, and came into the land of Babel and entered within the walls of Sarbur. These are all, of course, ancient medieval um, Middle Eastern uh, towns. I went down into Egypt, and my companions parted from me. I went straightway to the serpent, and settled down close by his inn until uh, he should slumber and sleep so that I might take the pearl from him. Since I was one and kept to myself, I was a stranger to my fellow dwellers in the inn. Yet saw I there one of my race, a fair and uh, well-favored youth, the son of kings. He came and uh, attached himself to me, and I made him my trusted familiar to whom I imparted my mission. I, he warned me against the Egyptians and the contact with the unclean ones, yet I clothed myself in their garments, let, lest they suspect me as one coming from without to take the pearl and arouse the serpent against me. But through some but through some cause, they marked that I was not their countryman, and they ingratiated themselves with me, and mixed me a drink with their cunning, and gave me to taste of their, their food. And I forgot that I was a king's son and served their king. I forgot the pearl for which my parents uh, had sent me through the heaviness of the, their nourishment, I sank into a deep slumber. Well, if you uh, are uh, desirous of a description of our present condition, that's exactly what it is. Not that I encourage you to go into a deep slumber as the result of my talk, which may happen also owing to its duller features. Uh, but we are, we, are, we, we are in a reduced state of consciousness. Uh, we are not what we are supposed to be. We don't have the perspicacity, the alacrity, the consciousness which uh, is really necessary to accomplish our ultimate task. Mm. Owing to uh, having partaken of uh, the external world, of the extroverted physical reality, our uh, capacity to, to uh, discern the desirable from the undesirable uh, diminishes, and we are uh, in an unhappy uh, condition. Uh, this, uh, this is the condition then of the human being. This is what in uh, Christian theology is referred to as the fall, uh, where, of course, a different mythology is attached to it. But the issue is that we uh, are of a different consciousness, of a different reality. We are uh, deeply involved spiritual beings. We are the children of the Most High. Somewhere deeply within us is a reality that uh, is of tremendously great importance, of tremendously great power, and that is capable of great things. But by uh, externalizing, extroverting our consciousness, by uh, looking to things that are 
not truly important, we fall into a swoon of forgetfulness of our, of our authentic nature and of our authentic purpose. And so the a very important task of life is to somehow recover the memory of who we really are and why we are really here and what indeed uh, may be the, uh, the deeds that we are here to uh, perform. Now then, uh, the question is while this is going on, and while we feel like a motherless child quite uh, justly, then the question arises, uh, are, we, uh, are we still in, in contact with something greater? Are we, uh, are we still being observed and hopefully guided? Is there something else? And of course, the, uh, the unpalatable food and drink of the lesser world makes us believe that there isn't. This is extremely important. The world is full of lies. Even before there was television, even before there were newspapers, uh, even before the, the liars were all over the place, it was already full of lies. But fortunately, <coughs> uh, in spite of the, uh, the world of falsehood within which we find ourselves, we have the capacity to work our way out of the, out of the falsehood. And why is that? Because inside of us there is still something that is connected to the supreme, to the ultimate, to the real, from whence we have come. And if we take advantage of it, then indeed our awakening from our stupor is assured and we may be able to fulfill ultimately the purpose for which we have come. And this is uh, mentioned in uh, the text, in, in the hymn, where it says, All this that befell me, my parents marked. Now the parents are the parents in heaven. And they were grieved for me. It was proclaimed in our kingdom that all should come to our gates. And the kings and grandees of Parthia and all the nobles of the East over plan that I must not be left in Egypt forsaken. And they wrote a letter to me, and each of the great ones signed it with his name. Now, this is, I think, is of extremely great importance because every day and every night in various ways and disguised in different forms and in, in the languages of the mind, so the message, the letter, the, uh, the inducement for awakening comes to us. But we have to be there to receive it. We have to take advantage of it. And here is the letter. From thy father, the king of kings, and from thy mother, the, the mistress of the east, and from thy brother, our next in rank, unto thee, our son in Egypt, greeting. And now comes the, the real message of the letter. And this is the real message that I assure you that even though perhaps uh, unbeknown to us, unconsciously, unaware, everyone in this room has received that letter. And the letter is there for us to apprehend and to internalize. Here is the letter. Awake and rise up out of thy sleep and perceive the words of our letter. Remember that thou art the king's son. Behold whom thou hast served in bondage. Be mindful of the pearl for whose sake thou hast departed into Egypt. 
remember thy robe of glory, recall thy splendid mantle, that thou mayest put them on, and deck thyself with them, and thy name be read in the book of the heroes, and thou become with thy brother our deputy, heir in our kingdom. Awake and arise. Don't be uh, in a state of uh, dullness and of forgetfulness any longer, but remember. And so often in the course of my, by now rather long life, in various ways and in various languages, I heard that sentence. Awake and arise. Remember who you are. And all of these people out here, and Russians and communists and Nazis and uh, various stupid people, they try to convince you that you are someone else. Yet, you have the letter within you. You have the awakener implanted in you. And the awakener day and night cries out to you and says, remember, remember who you are, and then you will remember your task in this life, and you will fulfill the purpose for which you have been sent. This can be done. It's one of the more, it's one of the easier tasks of uh, mystical perception is to, to, is the reminder to hear the, to hear the words of the letter. Because somehow uh, it is, <laughs> how can I, how can I explain this? I think the, uh, the message, the message from on high that contains the insight of who you are and why you are here, and what you are supposed to accomplish. This, uh, this is truly, as the scripture says, it is nearer than breathing and closer than hands and feet. Or as the prophet Muhammad says, the divine is closer to us than our jugular vein. It's a very practical Arab way of putting things, you know, but... And so then, you know, really what, uh, what are we to do? Uh, how are we to uh, come close to that message? How are we to read that message? Well, of course, in the... Uh, I read a little more of what happens when he comes closer to the letter. Like a messenger was the letter that the king had sealed with his right hand against the evil ones, the children of Babel and the rebellious demons of Sarbu. It rose up in the form of an eagle. It rose up in the form of an, an eagle the king of the winged fowl, and flew until it alighted beside me and became holy speech. Now this, uh, this is maybe a little bit difficult to relate to unless you uh, have experienced it yourself. It's not that difficult to experience that uh, uh, the, the visual, uh, the vision, the the visual impressions of the great world and of its messages come first. First you can see, then you will hear. And that is not always, but very frequently. And so it says it became holy speech. As its voice and sound, at its voice and sound I awoke and arose from my sleep, took it up, kissed it, namely the letter, and it broke its seal, and, and I read. Just as was written on my heart were the words of my letter to read. I remembered that I was a child of kings, and that my freeborn and 
soul desired its own kind. What a memory. The most important memory of, of, of life. To uh, remember who you are and that your freeborn soul desired its own, desires its own kind. I remembered the pearl for which I had been sent down into Egypt and began to uh, enchant the terrible and snorting serpent. Now I'll tell you a little, little funny thing about that in a minute. I charmed it, namely the serpent, to sleep by naming over it my father's name, the name of our next in rank, and that of my mother, the Queen of the East. I seized the pearl and turned to repair home to my father. Their filthy and impure garment I put off and left it behind in their land and directed my, uh, my way that I might come to the light of our homeland, the East. Now, uh, all right. Uh, it, is, uh, it is of great uh, importance that... Uh, in the that the that the reminders that the messages that the letters that come to us daily and nightly be uh, received and apprehended and put to use and uh, the reason for that is the or let's say the the rationality of that is that we need to develop increasingly uh, organs of reception that has often been called the inner ear. Uh, as, uh, through the inner ear, we can hear the words of the letter. And I assure you that difficult as it is with the distractions of this world, when, uh, when you receive some of that message, when some of those words come to you, when you realize that you have not only not been left alone, but that you are receiving the active encouragement, uh, the, uh, the, the active illumination and guardianship uh, of another and greater power, then uh, your task appears far less difficult and indeed, you are able to, to fulfill the, the strange tasks that have been set to you. So it is, uh, it is important to listen. It is important to uh, hear the still, small voice. And, uh, you know, it is, there are, again, you have to remember, first. Oh, well, you have to meditate, you have to contemplate, you have to do this, you have to do that. You have to listen. You have to be attentive. You have to uh, realize that something important, some important voice, some important communication, some important reminder is coming to you and will indeed uh, inform you of what you are to do and how to, uh, how to go about it. So uh, this is of, of very great importance. And uh, often when uh, uh, the discovery, let's say, of the pearl, the ability to put the roaring serpents who in some of the translations is called the snorting serpent. And I remember that when we, uh, uh, we had uh, earlier in our career, we had a whole bunch of young people here, and many of them were very theatrically uh, inclined. And so we actually put together a little uh, theatrical performance of the hymn of the Pearl. And... Uh, so it was suggested to me, but I resisted it powerfully, that when the 
fellow who would play the serpent should have uh, some uh, something sticking out of his nose whereby he is snorting. You understand? But we didn't do it. No, we didn't do it. But but uh, but let us say uh, the. Uh, It is, uh, I, I will come to it later, but it is also interesting to note, as we will see in the text itself, that what did, uh, what did the, uh, the royal prince from heaven do in order to uh, uh, pacify the, the roaring or snorting serpent? Uh, what, uh, uh, how, how was he able to char charm him? He charmed him by magic. And the magic was that he, he chanted, he sang in the name of his heavenly father to the, uh, to the uh, serpent, and then the serpent fell asleep. So the, uh, the invoking of the supernal power, first of all, the acknowledging of the supernal power, and then uh, the invoking of the supernal power is magic. I have mentioned other times, and I don't mind mentioning it again, that uh, um, uh, there is a, an incident which uh, I have always considered to be of uh, considerable uh, importance. And that incident had to do with the people, especially one, of the gentleman who founded Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, uh, uh, he uh, wrote a letter with uh, all the various uh, points of uh, doctrine and of teaching and of practice of Alcoholics Anonymous and sent it to Jung. Jung sent it back to him and said, there is one, one problem. Nowhere in your, uh, in your script that you sent to me do I see a reference to the sup supernal power. He said, without the acknowledgement and the presence of the superior power, which I think was the, the translation from the German, uh, your project will fail. But if you include it, and you, you have it there as a reality to be uh, invoked and to be utilized, then you will be creating a very good thing. And here is, of course, one of the great problems, not only of various individuals like ourselves, but, uh, uh, oh, but let's say of our entire society. Another, uh, at another time, C.G. Jung said that everyone in this world needs to be anchored in God. Now, to be anchored means that you, you have a, a connection that will keep you from drifting off. And uh, I think it's the supernatural, the... the, the um, the celestial anchor is of very great importance. And so uh, we need to recall, to bring to our attention again and again, number one, that we are here for a purpose. What is that purpose? The purpose will reveal itself in the doing. The purpose will reveal itself when the line of communication with the transcendental source is activated and is vivified. I can testify to it that if you work on that and if you keep that in your mind, then there, well, there will be times of uh, forgetfulness, times of despair even, times of within which you, the purpose of your, of your life and your, your life's mission, your deeper mission will go into obscurity, but it will come back. You must 
create that connection, that anchor, with what? With transcendence, with that incredible reality from whence you have come and whither you are going. That incredible reality which to uh, have contact with and to recognize is the most valuable, the most wonderful, the most joyous thing that you can do. But you, as we started out, you have to have a feeling for it. It is not something that is going to come through your uh, intellectualizing about it. It is not something that will come in a, in a pseudo-scientific way, but it is something that is felt. And so when you go about the tasks of life, try to, try to feel, try to, try to open up that in, interior ear and listen to a strange voice that keeps coming, that keeps telling you, you are ours, you are mine. We have sent you where you are, and if you do what, what we inspire you to do, then indeed, as the English mystic said, all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. Knowing with Gnosis is knowing, first of all, who you are, secondly, why you are here, and thirdly, how to return to your origins. And if you can keep these in mind, and if you never let them be covered up by any uh, exterior uh, factor, then you will fulfill the purpose for which you have been sent. You will uh, be who you, are, who you are supposed to be, and you will find a treasure. Next few times we will talk some more about that. That pearl, the pearl of great price, the, the treasure that the, that the dragon has, and also what the, the dragon might mean. But let us say, uh, even though it may not look like it, I am not a great admirer of this world, as you have probably gathered already. You know, no, no, I'm not. Uh, and of hardly anything in it. And I went clear across the, the gigantic ocean to uh, experience on the other side of it and so forth. And you know what? It's the same mess over here <laughs> <laughs> that, it, that it was where I came from. And nothing, uh, nothing to write home about if you are writing home about. Uh, but let us say you have to feel the possibility of contact. You have to reach out for that late letter which comes on the wings of the eagle and it will remind you who you are and why you are here. And then you will do it. On the other hand, you say, I'm going to then become real happy. I'm going to become very rich. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to have, uh, have all the things that this world uh, promises you. No. But you will have a feeling that you, ha you have now come close to something that is incredibly important. Something that is the most important thing, not only here, but in all the universes placed together. And that is your alignment with the eternal purpose, with the great mystery, which is not a strange country to us. No. Why? Because a, a portion of it, a, a jewel, a pearl is of that reality is within us. And as we aspire toward it, and as we try to fulfill our commitment that we will take it back to the eternal and to the, the heavenly realm, and everything changes, and we have found 
a real purpose, a, a purpose for which we have been sent and which we, if we fulfill, we can return our true home and to our true connection. It is, this is not a dream. This is not a projection. This is a process. This is an activity that has been with humankind from the beginning and that is still here. And that if we, if we become conscious of it, if we become uh, dedicated to it, if we uh, will do what needs to be done in order to accomplish this, then we will find that our journey to this strange and uh, weird and uh, often so sad and counterproductive and terrifying world will have changed into something better. And uh, we will see that there is a purpose. And the purpose is the return to our origins and the taking of some great mystery that we may find here. And so I will conclude with the, uh, with the speculation, because that's about all we can do is, so what is the pearl? What kind of a pearl is being held by the roaring serpent here that in a mysterious and magical way by chanting the name of our origins, by, by recollecting where we have come from and who we have come from, we can gain again. Hmm? It had many names. It was the stone of the philosopher. Uh, it was the Holy Eucharist. It was the body of Christ. It was many things. And it still is. There is a treasure. And that treasure is located within you already. It only needs to be brought into consciousness. It only needs to be remembered. You know, the very word remember is a strange word. Because uh, uh, it rem when I say remember, I, I always think of Osiris speaking of the land of Egypt. Why? Because Osiris has been uh, dismembered by his evil brother and the portions of his body scattered throughout the world. And then uh, his, uh, his son Horus, the hawk-headed uh, savior, comes and puts the portions of Osiris together and so the remembering is the acquisition of wholeness. That which has been cut off and taken away and hidden away now comes back and the wholeness appears. And this wholeness, the great medicine of that wholeness, the great miracle that accomplishes that is the pearl. The pearl of uh, transcendental consciousness. The 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 pearl which will uh, uh, continue to uh, uh, create its relationship and your relationship with the eternal. A little incident comes to my mind which does not have a great deal to do with this, this but I'll tell it to you anyway. Uh, it has to do with uh, one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, stories that Mr. Manley Hall told a number of times. He went every, every year, you know, in the summertime when he could, uh, he went to Japan. That was his uh, vacation land. And uh, uh, so he, he mentioned this as, a, as an example of the wonderful symbolic thinking that the, uh, he, he was invited to come out to the ocean the shore of the ocean, where the uh, the famous uh, 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 what uh, pearls uh, of the Mikimoto's pearls 
uh, what, what you they are not artificial pearls, but they, Object. yeah, they've been stimulated to uh, to grow or are present. And once a year, the, he said, the Buddhist monks and the Shinto priests both uh, on Mikimoto's beach come out and sit there and chant and pray, and they thank the souls of the pearls for having sacrificed themselves for the humans uh, and uh, for uh, this being their great mission uh, that they require a great deal of thank thanks and a great deal of gratitude. So that is, that is the gratitude for the pearl also. Uh, it's very, uh, uh, the, the, there are deep meanings to these symbols. So somewhere in our uh, bailiwick, somewhere in our household, in our town, on our street, in our country, there is a great treasure. A treasure that needs to be found. A treasure that belongs to heaven and the discovery and the utilization of which will bring heaven down to us and to you. This needs to be discovered. And uh, the forces that try to divert us from that, the, the forces that want to hang on to the pearl and not yield it, not to give it back, these forces can be defeated. And they, they, they can be defe defeated by the divine magic when you when you utter, when you chant over them the name of the uh, consciousness of highest heaven, then they turn about and then they will yield the, the pearl to us. So there is a lot more to the hymn of the pearl and various implications to which we can come. But let us keep it in mind that every great myth Every great story is our story. And as such, we, can, we should relate to it at that level. We have the ability and the duty to find a treasure. The treasure is here. And if we don't lose, lose heart, if we don't lose our courage, we can find it. We can discover it, and we, it, we can return it to its own transcendental, de deific, glorious, wondrous place where it really belongs. This is the stone of the philosophers. This is the great treasure, and it is within reach, within our reach. But in order to be such, we have to recover our connection with the, the greater kingdom from whence we have come and whether, whether we are going. Hopefully, uh, in course of this uh, month, we can go into further details of the, the hymn, the hymn of the robe of glory, and uh, thereby, uh, uh, come closer to that realization ourselves. I, it's a very bad thing for a speaker to apologize. Uh, and I apologize to the extent that my, uh, my strength is not what it usually is. But the vision is there. And with that vision, I communicate to you the conviction that we are all uh, potential uh, discoverers and reconquerors of a treasure, of a pearl. And that if we only need to keep, if we only keep this task uh, in mind, if we don't forget about it, if we only continue to read that letter that has been sent to us, then the purpose of our lives will, be, will have been fulfilled.
And so uh, I once again, I thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I extend some apologies a little bit for my lack of strength. But believe me, the, the pearl is there. And we shall find the pearl. And, the pearl. and with the pearl, we shall return to a wonder, to a, a great, incredible, unbelievable glory, which we know because we have been there, and there we shall return. So I thank you very much.